Hello, this is Dr. Rutledge, and this is a practice for my presentation tomorrow. I'm supposed to go in uh, under 15 minutes, and uh, I can't say hello in less than 15 minutes, so uh, this is a trial. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen, and we'll get started. Okay, and keep the mouse visible. I start off with a, a, a picture that uh, gives me a lot of pride. These are all the places I've been invited to go and teach the mini gastric bypass over the past 20 years. And so you can start from California uh, through North Carolina, Missouri, uh, Michigan, and other places that are actually not even on here. Uh, Mexico, um, <clears throat> Costa Rica, um, almost, I think um, most of the countries in uh, Europe, uh, the Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, Pakistan, India, um, most of the Middle East, Turkey, Egypt, um, Saudi. And uh, so it's uh, with great pleasure that I get a chance to talk about my baby, uh, the mini gastric bypass today. And I hope I'll find a little bit of entertainment for you. A recent uh, quote I found in preparing this, a uh, quote, he gesticulated as he spoke. He had a sense of humor, but often provoked an argument. And those who ventured to argue with him did so at their own risk, for he was a lively and passionate by nature and gave no quarter to those who argued with him. This was for Ivan Pavlov uh, of uh, Russia. And um, I'm not sure why I included it. <laughs> Um, I would say if I had to describe myself, I'm really nothing but a crusty old trauma surgeon. And uh, 40 years ago, when I began my training, um, trauma surgeons and surgeons in general were mostly male and mostly uh, rather overworked and a little bit harried and a little bit rough around the edges. And so I think we might see little bits of that in me. <clears throat> I was uh, for 20 years at the University of North Carolina in critical care, transplantation, uh, routine general surgery. And uh, I have to admit that we tended to look down on bariatric surgeons. <laughs> general surgeons, critical care, trauma, we tend to be fighters. If you go to one of our conferences, routinely you'll see people yelling at one another. And so we're kind of throwback, primitive kind of characters. And uh, But 20 years of trauma, in my experience, led to a lot of uh, experience with peptic ulcer disease, gastric cancer, and other general surgery general surgery that led to a lot of experience with uh, what we're going to talk about today, the Bill Roth II gastrojejunostomy. Just as a reminder, a little bit of history. In 1877, Bill Roth did the first gastrectomy. And uh, not too long after that, 1885, he performed the first Bill Roth II procedure. Um, <clears throat> early treatment had high mortality. And uh, as a treatment for peptic ulcer disease, the um, Bill Roth I had a high recurrence rate, so Dr. Mayo and others advocated that it should be a drainage procedure or what we would call, in retrospect, this gastroenterostomy of Bill Roth II. Um, this is where I began to do this type of operation, uh, those now half a century ago almost, and uh, that's where I got comfortable with the Bill Roth II as being a good friend of mine and a reliable and safe operation. It turns out that in my history, there's a very famous uh, surgeon and his student, uh, Lester Dragstadt, who invented the idea that uh, acid in the stomach was hormonal or a, a neurologic event. And he described in his animal studies and ultimately in humans that uh, the peptic ulcer disease ep epidemic that was going from the 1940s through the 1960s was related to the uh, acid from the vagus nerve. And uh, he was not only in this famous quote, he was not only the first amongst his equals, but he laid the cornerstone of American scientific surgery. His work and the path he bestrode provided an example for future generations and surgeons will always treasure. He fought for his beliefs because there was a tremendous amount of criticism for his idea, the idea that uh, the vagus nerve was releasing excess acid in a cause of peptic ulcer disease, and therefore it could be a cure. 
and he was quite a young uh, a fighter as a young man and an old man and he his, his as a teacher of mine and his student uh, dr edward woodward at the university of florida were both relatively tough uh teachers of mine when i was a medical student there low these many years ago and uh, i'm honored to present his name and to uh, think in some ways i follow in his footsteps the story of the first truncal vagotomy is uh, interesting because we're going to talk about the first mgb but he had a patient with severe bleeding ulcer and he was scheduled for a partial gastrec gastrectomy and the man refused shouting that operation killed my father and my brother said he wishes he was dead with the same operation um, so Dr. Woodward, who was an intern at the time, and Dr. Uh, Dragstadt uh, had some uh, signatures from the patient, and they performed the first vagotomy on a patient who refused to accept the standard operation. Some years later, with several hundred patients, they were able to begin to show that they were right, that their tough, rather <clears throat> uh, <laughs> abrasive approach to bringing something new into the world, uh, change the entire world's treatment of peptic ulcer disease for the better. Doctors Dragstad and Woodward were my teachers. They taught me what I would say is to fight for what I believe in. And 23 years ago, I performed the first mini gastric bypass. And now my little one is growing around the world. I received, like Dr. Dragstad, quite a bit of criticism. And I I wouldn't even get close to listing all of it, but for example, you might not remember that it was standard for many surgeons to take out the gallbladder when they did bariatric surgery. And I can tell you, I was bitterly criticized for that. You may not recall, but the first Roux and Y gastric bypass was done by pulling a large EEA anvil, the big piece of steel, like a giant um, nail being pulled down through the esophagus. And there the gastrojejunostomy was done retrogastric and retrocolic, bringing a loop up through the transverse mesocolon. And when I did my MGB, which was so much easier, they said, oh no, it must not be that way. They said, of course, uh, you've heard this even today that still the MGB is the old Mason loop and your patients will all be suffering crippling bile reflux and gastric cancer. They also said, of course, the Bilrotu causes cancer, which is incorrect, that the pouch, sorry, the pouch and the gastrojejunostomy were too big. That because of that, it wasn't a small pouch like the Ruin Y. None of my patients would lose weight. And I'm amused to remind uh, those of you who were alive back in those days that I was criticized for using something called email and that I had a website. <laughs> Bariatric surgeons did not and do not understand basic general surgery. I'm going to show you just a little bit of data, but the Bill Raw 2 is a good operation. It improves and decreases the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the risk of stroke. And I'll just show you three quick papers. This is a nationwide population-based study. Everyone in the entire country of Taiwan who had a Bill Raw 2 gastrojejunostomy for peptic ulcer disease was compared to similar age and otherwise matched controls. So you could have a pe peptic ulcer. If you had a Bill Roth II, you were compared. And if you had a Bill Roth II, you were healthier. Same age and other comorbidities. The Bill Roth II made you better and protected you from stroke. And that was more protective the sicker you were and the older you were. Similarly, nationwide population-based decrease in the incidence of coronary heart disease Heart attack was 22% less, coronary artery disease of any kind, and hospitalizations less. And quote, we found that the Bill Roth II was associated with reduced risk of all forms of coronary heart disease, again, a nationwide population-based study. Finally, one more study, a 50% decrease in diabetes. In other words, if you had the misfortune or surprisingly good fortune, to have a Bill Roth II for peptic ulcer disease, you had a 50% lower risk of diabetes. The Bill Roth II is good for you. General surgeons know it. Most bariatric surgeons are confused about it, even now, 23 years later. Why did the bariatric surgeons of the world get confused? Well, because of this 
good old Ed Mason, he was a good man. He did a Bill Roth II, but he violated the basic principles of general surgery. It's not really a Bill Roth II as Bill Roth did it. And these patients all good bioreflux, but it's not because of the loop, it's because it was mismanagement here. But anyways, now 23 years later, still general surgeons, bariatric surgeons, especially in America, can't figure this out. But what's happening? That's all kind of behind us. Well, not in America. America, as you may have seen in the last four years, <clears throat> we have had some leadership issues. <laughs> but what's happened? Well, the lap band has been declared a failure and seems to be going away. And the MGB seems to be recognized slowly but surely as a success. And here's an example of not slowly but surely, but a five-year analysis of the Israel bariatric surgery registry. And what's happened is sleeve gastrectomy has dropped from 80% down to 37% of all cases in 2018 from 2014. And mini gastric bypass went essentially from zero to half of all surgeries in the country of Israel. And you might wonder what is behind this? Why is this happening? This is the same numbers just graphically demonstrating what's going on with sleeve in Israel. It's a bad operation. It's the root, it's nothing more than the lap band done over. Well, why is that happening? Well, let me suggest, what if one out of three of your patients fail? Here's the data from India. In this study, they studied post-operative weight regain. And what they found, and this is self-reporting from almost 10,000 patients in India, sleeves have one out of every three patients regaining their weight, a 30 plus percent failure rate. Ruin Y, 15%, MGB, 3%. The MGB, the Bill Roth II, is a good operation. 23 years later, it's being recognized. And so I think back to my teachers, Dr. Dragstadt and Dr. Woodward, and I feel maybe they would be proud of me. So I'm asked to talk in just these few minutes, where did it all begin? And so again, I was a trauma, trauma surgeon. I was one of the first people in the world to do the laparoscopic ruin Y, and I can talk about it. It was really a nightmare. Three, four and five hour cases were, uh, were not unusual. As a professor of surgery for 20 years at the time, I was on call one night in September, 1997. There in a nearby town of Durham, North Carolina, a drug dealer, was involved in a gunshot wound attack, and he was shot six times in the abdomen with a 357 Magnum, a big, big high-powered handgun um, load. Nine o'clock on a Thursday night in September 1997, I took him to emergency surgery. What we found was multiple gunshot wounds to the stomach, the tail of pancreas, and multiple loops of small bowel. So what we decided to do to remediate the multiple injuries is we did a resection of the distal stomach, which was involved. We did a resection of the pancreas and the spleen, and we repaired multiple loops of small bowel and uh, staunch bleeding in the kidney and the retroperitoneum with direct pressure. So we reconstructed after resecting all that with a standard Bill Roth II gastrojejunostomy. This is an operation that I had been doing for my some 20 years at the University of North Carolina. I had done it routinely for gastric cancer, for uh, peptic ulcer disease, before the development of H2 blockers and uh, PPIs uh, took us out of that business. And of course, for this case in trauma. It's a routine operation, it's a good operation. And I had a great deal of experience with it. And uh, so the next morning I had a patient scheduled for another uh, laparoscopic ruin Y. I had had uh, difficulty and complications with that, and I thought this is by far a better operation. So what we'll do here is create essentially nothing more than a collis gastroplasty and an anticholic Bill Roth II gastrojejunostomy. It turns out that this is basic routine general surgery, and those patients did quite well. What we see now is something very unusual, which is that many of the surgeons that I've trained around the world have been, reported sim have been reporting similarly excellent results. We can see on the dais for today, many of my brothers who I've had the good fortune to be invited to visit and uh, work with them. And many of them have reported superb to outstanding results. 
On the other hand, we also see that some surgeons are reporting terrible results with the MGB. And we think of, for example, the Y Omega trial, which in, in a gentle uh, way, I would say is terrible surgeons doing a bad operation and not taking advantage of any training in doing it. Their report is they read one paragraph in one of my articles done more than 10 years ago, and that's how they decided to do the MGB. So what we think now is that we are on the threshold of the MGB being done both well and badly. And that's maybe the most important point to bring up today. And we look forward to Dr. Billy's comments on that. Again, there are bad ways to do a Bill Roth too. There are bad ways to do every operation, the sleeve, the Roux and Y, the biliopancreatic diversions, all of these have potential to be done badly. Well-informed general surgeons routinely use the Bill Roth II. Often uninformed bariatric surgeons fear the Bill Roth II. Great, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do the MGB. Just in summary, it's antrectomy and gastrojejunostomy. It's non-obstructive restriction. In other words, it doesn't work at all like a Roux Y or a lap band or a sleeve. And the anticholic Bill Roth II is unique because it has a tailored bypass to the individual patient's needs. Again, these are the criticisms. <laughs> and we see overall that MGB is a simple, elegant, effective, durable, powerful, tailored to the patient, reversible and revisable operation. Um, I'm really uh, appreciating the opportunity to get this uh, meeting uh, off to a start. I'll try and go ahead and finish up now early. And I thank you all for the invitation to open this meeting. And I return the meeting now to Dr. Fovey. Thank you.